Okay, welcome back. So today we're going to talk about Rome. Rome, of course, starts out as a very small nation right there on the central coast of Italy, but it eventually becomes not only the inheritor of classical civilization, it spreads that classical civilization all the way to Western Europe, conquering large sections of what eventually would become France and England and all of the Mediterranean. So how does it achieve that? Well, let's talk about Rome first. So Rome is located just a little bit inland from uh, the central Italian coast in the region called Campania, right there. The port city is called Ostia Antica, and that's where the Tiber River empties out into the sea. But a little further up on the Tiber River, we have the section of Rome itself. And Rome is pretty much defined by the Tiber Island. The Tiber Island is an island that's in the middle of the river that splits the river in two. And it's there, you can see it anciently, it was the site of a temple to Asclepius and a number of other deities. Those bridges that you see connecting it in the middle were actually built during the Roman period and they're still in use. Now you may wonder, why is this island so important? Well, it's important for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, uh, it made a natural crossing place in the river. It's much easier to cross two shallow streams than one big stream. And so this is where trade routes would cross the river. So naturally, a settlement develops on one side of the river right next to this crossing. But it's also the legendary location where Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome, were discovered. So the story of Romulus and Remus is an interesting one. It goes all the way back to the 8th century BC. And the story goes that a woman uh, by the name of Rhea Silvia, who was a Vestal Virgin and was daughter of the former king, Numitor, uh, suddenly became pregnant. Uh, now she claimed that she had been visited by the god Mars and that this was a miraculous pregnancy. Uh, but her uncle and the current king really didn't like this and feared this, and so he had sought to have her exiled. So she gave birth to the children and put them in a basket and placed them in the Tiber River and floated them down the Tiber River. And the river god of, Ty of the Tiber protected them and washed them up ashore on the point of the Tiber Island. It was there that a shepherd came by and saw these two young boys being nursed by a she-wolf. So this is the imagery here that you see of them being nursed by a she-wolf. He decided this must be a sign from the gods, so he adopted them as his own children and took them home. And they quickly grew up to be very powerful, strong, great heroic men uh, that became leaders of their community. And so Romulus and Remus started a new city right on opposite where the Tiber Island is. So this is the topography of Rome, and of course there's seven hills to Rome, but there's only a few that you have to know. The two big important ones are gonna be the Capitoline and the Palatine, and sandwiched in between those is where the Roman Forum is going to be. But the story goes that Romulus and Remus set out to found a new city. Of course, there was a contest to see which one of them was going to be the ruler of the new city. So they did what was commonly done in the Roman world, and that was known as augury. Augury is where you witness the flight of birds. You'll notice that there's an eagle here in this relief. And so the eagle is an auspicious uh, omen. So the story goes that Romulus did a sacrifice and he saw 12 eagles go by and Remus saw, did a sacrifice and saw six eagles or vultures go by. It depends on the story. And of course that's auspicious for both of them, but Romulus, uh, because he has more um, birds, he gets the opportunity to found a city. And he wanted to found the city on the Palatine Hill, which is located right there. But Remus disagreed. And so Remus wanted to found a new city on the Aventine Hill, which is down here. So they eventually came to blows and uh, Romulus kills his brother, Remus. And so that's why the city is known as Rome instead of Reem. And I think we can all be very grateful for that. 
And the city was supposedly founded in the year 753 BC on April 21st. And if you go to Rome today, they still celebrate April 21st as the birthday of the city. So who knows how much of that story is true, but sure enough, if you go up to the Palatine Hill, there is a very early Iron Age settlement of very primitive huts up there. You can even see the foundations of some of these huts. And the Romans believed that one of these foundations was the hut of Romulus himself. We've talked about this before, but when we look at these huts and these foundations, they look very much like these Villanovan huts or these Villanovan hut urns, indicating that the Romans are in fact the descendants of the earliest Italic peoples living in the region. So this gets us the earliest history of Rome. We have all the same kind of basic time periods that we have in ancient Greece, the geometric, the orientalizing, the archaic, and the classical. We have the Villanovan and Italic tribes that go back quite far. You have the Latins, which is one of these Italic tribes, and this is when Rome is founded, sometime in the 8th century. But remember, we also have the Etruscans who move into the area, and they end up conquering Rome. And so a great deal of what we consider to be Roman culture is actually Etruscan culture. And eventually the Etruscans are overthrown, but that's going to be a little bit in the future. So the joke about Rome is that Rome wasn't built in a day, and it wasn't built by Romans either. It was built by Etruscans. So the earliest phase of the city in the Archaic period, the high point of Etruscan civilization, it is under Etruscan rule. But the original settlement was right there on the Palatine Hill, but it quickly spread and was encompassed inside a, a city wall that we call the Servian Wall. And a major temple was placed on the Capitoline Hill that we call the Capitolium. And nestled in between these two hills is the Roman Forum. So before we go on to really what is the, the true founding of Rome, we need to talk a little bit about what Etruscan influence culture came over. We talked about the Etruscans before during the Archaic period, but the Etruscans continue to be a major power, but they are waning in influence. Their high point was going to be in the 6th century. By the time we reach the 5th and the 4th century, you're going to see them waning. The Romans throw them uh, overthrow the Etruscan rule, and you start to see Etruscan civilization become much more Hellenized. They take on the uh, ideas of the Greeks, and as the Greeks become more expressive into the Hellenistic period, they're going to capture more of that. One of the things that the Etruscans are really known for is their bronzes. We have a lot of original Etruscan bronzes. We don't have a lot of Greek bronzes, so that's really quite impressive. The Etruscan bronzes are very lively, dynamic, and expressive. This is the Chimera of Arezzo, which is this story that comes from, again, Greek myth. Uh, Bellephoron rides on the back of Pegasus, and he defeats this horrible monster, which has the midsection of a goat, uh, the body of a lion, and the tail of a serpent. So this is clearly coming out of Greek myth. But you can see in the anatomy of the lion, not so much in the face and in the mane, but in the body of the lion, this increasing naturalism. You see that also in Etruscan sculpture. This is a slightly smaller than life-size sculpture of an individual wearing a lorica, armor. But when we look at this person, you'll notice that he has the same contraposto as other Greek statues that are coming out of the 4th century. So there's this evidence that they are very much aware of what the Greeks are doing, and they're emulating it. They're picking up on that high level of naturalism with the weight shift, the contraposto, the attention to detail, and muscles. One of the things that's really interesting is that they still continue to have a preference for terracotta works and terracotta sculpture. And remember, they did have sarcophagi, but they also developed this recumbent sarcophagi. This is a sarcophagus which has a person reclining on the top of it as if they're reclining on a bench. Sometimes these are made out of terracotta, sometimes these are made out of stone. Here we have an Etruscan individual who's holding a scroll uh, with an inscription, and below we have a relief scene that shows gods of the Etruscan underworld. One of my favorite examples of this is this reclining couple sarcophagus uh, which again comes from the 4th century. This one comes out of Volci and is currently in the Boston Museum of Arts. And it has, in addition to reliefs around the outside that show uh, deities from the Etruscan concept of the underworld, we have a husband and wife uh, reclining and embracing together. So if you remember, 
we did have in the archaic period the same kind of idea of the husband and wife together in this reclining banquet. The banquet idea is gone but we're still seeing this idea of couples together. This is not something that you see in Greek art. In Greek art, women are clearly subservient. It's very sexist. So there's this interesting kind of humanistic touch uh, where men and women are, are seen as kind of equivalent and Etruscan women have much uh, higher status in Etruscan society than uh, women had in Greek society. But you can see the influence of Greek culture. Look at the drapery. It's much more naturalistic. Uh, it's not archaic anymore. Uh, the features are much more individualized. Uh, there's a much greater sense of anatomy, but there's also a, a sense of pathos. Remember, pathos is one of these things that was invented by the Greeks. This sense of the internal life and suffering of the figures. They're not just this happy-go-lucky couple enjoying a banquet into the afterlife. Uh, they are truly together in this embrace, and even though it's tender, uh, it does have this kind of sadness. It has this kind of uh, grief to it, uh, which is appropriate to a couple uh, carved onto a sarcophagus. We see this same kind of thing influence the Etruscans everywhere. We start to see tomb paintings become much more uh, dark in their tone. First of all, the subject matter is going to be more uh, Greek. They're going to be copying Greek myths. This one comes from the Francois tomb at Vulci, and in this case we have a scene of Achilles uh, sacrificing the Trojan prisoners in honor of Patroclus, who has recently been killed. And so we see in the middle a very grisly scene of Achilles dispatching the prisoners, but notice that we have contraposto, high degree of modeling. It's a pretty good sense of what maybe Greek painting would have been like. But just so we know this is an Etruscan scene, we have a couple of characters tucked in there. We have a winged figure known as Vanth and Kavrun, which is this strange blue-skinned guy who wields a hammer, and these are Etruscan deities of the underworld. So the themes are going to be darker, they're not going to be as uh, positive as they were in the early archaic period, and again this seems to be the influence of this idea of pathos coming over from the Greeks. So the Etruscans give a lot of their culture to the Romans, and eventually the Romans overthrow the Etruscans. In 509 BC, Brutus overthrows Tarquin Superbus, the last Etruscan king of Rome. And the story goes something like this. A woman by the name of Lucretia, who was this Roman matron and matriarch of the city, was raped by the son of the king, and then she eventually committed suicide. And so Brutus, a Roman citizen, said, that's it, we're done with kings. We're going to get rid of Tarquin Superbus, Tarquin the Proud, and he stages a revolt. And so this begins the period that we call Republican Rome. And the reason we call it Republican Rome is because the Romans decided they'd had enough of kings and they wanted a form of government that had no kings. So Brutus and his fellow nobles and aristocrats instead create a new form of government that is called the Res Publica or the Republic. And res publica is Latin, and all it means is the public thing, or the public affair, the thing that we all do. And so they decide there's not going to be any more kings. Instead, they're going to have a governing body. This is representative government. We live in a republic. So that's how old this idea is. And this period is now going to be called Republican Rome because of this new type of government that comes in. And it lasts until the time Emperor Augustus comes along. And Emperor Augustus establishes the Roman Empire, even though he claims to restore the Roman Republic. But that's why restores is in scare quotes there. And so we need to talk about how Roman government and Roman society really was fundamentally different from Greek society and even Greek democracy. So. A republic is a government of elective representatives. You have 12 tables of law in Roman law, so they have a kind of constitutional government. Those laws were publicly displayed on tablets so that everybody knew what they were. And then you had a governing body known as the Senate, and our Senate is named for the Roman Senate. And the Senate is an elected body of aristocrats. These are nobles. Uh, in Roman society, we call them patricians. And these would come together 
to enact all the laws. And they're pretty much the chief legislative and executive body. And they're ruled by two consuls. The consuls are elected for one-year terms, and that way you, you don't have one power base. You have two consuls that are playing off of each other. And when you were done with being a consul, you would go on to what was called a proconsular command. You would go on to rule one of the Roman provinces, but as an appointment from the Senate. And it was a very effective form of government. It was much more representative. And because it wasn't a pure democracy, it actually was a little bit more efficient. In fact, there are several Greek writers who admire the Roman system because the Roman system was noted for its rule of law and for its efficiency. At first, there was just the Roman Senate, but eventually uh, the commoners that we call the plebeians or the plebs uh, began to chafe under the rule of this body of aristocrats. And so there is established this thing called the Tribune of the Plebs. Uh, the tribunes were elected by tribes. There were 14 historical tribes in the city of Rome, and each one of them would elect a tribune, and he would essentially be a judge. And he would get to judge legal cases and other matters. And they were popularly elected. And they had power to suspend the laws and judgments of the Senate, uh, which gives us the term veto. Uh, the, our word veto comes from the Latin word for veto. So you establish a balance of power where you have the commoners, have the tribunes, and the aristocrats, the patricians, have the Senate. But what's interesting is you see that power actually shifts uh, back and forth constantly. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are, there are stories of people who were born into patrician families, were born of Senate rank, but they actually changed their name so they could run for office as a pleb, as a tribune, uh, because there was more power as a tribune than there was as a senator. And so it really worked. It actually wound up being a kind of representative government. And this kind of government really does reflect in the character of Roman art and culture. So this is the Roman Curia, this is the Roman Senate House. Uh, this one was actually built uh, in the third century, uh, but it's built right on the same grounds as the original Curia. So it's still standing, you can go see it today. Uh, it's missing its porch, its reconstruction, it would have looked like this. If you go to the interior, it's a rather plain building, uh, but it has series of benches on both sides, so the walls would have been covered with marble. It would have looked something like this. And so this is where the Roman senators would gather and they would debate the laws of the time and they would debate and act as representatives of the Roman people. And so this is the first thing that is really quite different than we see in the Athenian democracy. The Athenian democracy was very fractious and it tended to be dominated by strongmen. Eventually that'll happen in Rome too, but not in the beginning. Uh, and so Rome is going to have a lot more civic art and civic-minded art. You can see art as a form of public expression and civic virtue. And there's no better demonstration of this. This is actually an Etruscan statue, but the figure here is a Roman senator. This is Aulus Metellus. He's sometimes called uh, Lorengatore or the orator. <clears throat> and you can see that, you know, he's not an athlete. He's not a hero. He's not a god. He's an ordinary man. He wears a tunic and he wears a toga. And a toga is the status of a free man. He holds up his hand in a gesture of oration. Notice that he wears boots. Everybody thinks Romans wore sandals, and they did from time to time, but Romans wore boots. Uh, you don't think about that, but it's true. And you can compare this statue to, say, the kind of statues that Greeks were making in bronze. Uh, it's very, very different. Instead of dedications to idealized figures and heroes, and Romans did a fair amount of that too, it's going to be a dedication to a politician. It shows how much civic life was important in Roman society. And the toga is more than just a mode of dress. I know everybody thinks if they're wearing sheets, it's a toga, uh, but that's not true. A toga is not a sheet. Uh, it's actually a very uh, interesting and specific form of garment. Uh, it was initially worn as a cloak by both men and women of rank in Etruscan society, but eventually it becomes uh, 
solely the mark of free men who are born free in their society. And it was a mark of status. And it's this semicircular garment, you can see it here, and it's draped around the body in a very specific way. So when you see a togadis or a figure with a toga, it's more than just a guy wearing a cloak. It is somebody demonstrating his status in Roman society. And so status and freedom in Roman society are very important markers of art and culture. And in fact, that's one of the key identifiers of Roman society. So what you're seeing up here on the right is a Roman diploma. Uh, all of you are in college, all of you seek to get a diploma, uh, hopefully in four years, uh, maybe five or six. But this is a Roman diploma, and it's where we get the word diploma. Uh, your diplomas will be printed on paper and won't be... Uh, engraved on uh, bronze, but yeah, uh, the Roman uh, worked a little bit harder for his diploma. And this was given to people who had served 20 years in the Roman military. Rome was an empire and it conquered all of these other territories. But instead of simply subjugating people, they gave people the opportunity to become Romans. So if you agreed to serve in the Roman military and serve for 20 years, you would get a diploma. And the diploma guaranteed your citizenship, but also the citizenship of your sons and your grandsons and all future generations. You would have all the rights, privileges of being a Roman. We also see tombs and monuments that we call freedmen monuments or tombs, such as this one. And these are monuments that uh, declare the pride that these individuals have in achieving Roman citizenship. This is the Freedman Monument to Publius Aedius and his wife. Both of them were slaves. Both of them were owned by another Roman, but eventually achieved, either purchased or were rewarded with their freedom and became freedmen. And their children could then have all the rights of Roman citizens. And this was very important because it meant that if you were a Roman citizen, you could vote, uh, you could own land, you could own your own slaves, uh, but you also had the protection of Roman law. And Roman law was very important to Romans. I don't know if you are uh, read the uh, book of Acts, but there's this wonderful story in it where uh, Paul, that is St. Paul, is sent to prison and he is flogged by a Roman. And only after he's been flogged does the Roman centurion realize that Paul is a Roman citizen. Now, Paul was a Jew, but he was also born a Roman citizen, which means he had rights. Now, in the Roman world, you can flog a non-Roman all you want, but you cannot flog a Roman citizen. So the centurion is suddenly very nervous because he realizes he's, he's committed this terrible breach of law. And now Paul can make his appeal, and he eventually makes his appeal all the way to Caesar, and he goes all the way to Rome. That's astonishing, but every free citizen in Rome could expect that kind of protection. So the genius of Rome and the system of government that it had is that it could expand the benefits of Roman citizenship to everyone. That if you wanted to be Roman, you could be Roman. There were all kinds of ways you could become a citizen. Uh, you could perform a great deed in service to the empire. Uh, if you were a woman and you had six male children, you were automatically freed and all your children were freed. It was kind of interesting. That was considered to be a, a really great deal. Uh, one of my favorite <laughs> illustrations of this principle actually comes from Monty Python's uh, Life of Brian. So if you've ever seen this movie, there's this wonderful scene where John Cleese and Eric Idle and uh, Terry Pallon uh, are playing uh, this group of radicals who are trying to free, uh, they're playing this group of Judean radicals who are trying to free Judea uh, from the Roman rule. And John Cleese says, after all, what have the Romans ever done for us? And as he says this, there's a bit of silence and then somebody raises their hand and says, well, there's the aqueduct. And it's like, 
what? And I says, well, there was there was the aqueduct. They brought us the aqueduct, and now we have clean water. And he says, okay, 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 aside from the aqueduct. And then somebody else says, well, they brought wine. We didn't have wine. And, oh, yeah, and they brought health care, and they, uh, you know, they repaired the roads, and uh, they got rid of crime, <laughs> and <laughs> all these things. So John Cleese says, okay, aside from the aqueduct, and the wine, and the health care, and the roads, and the crime, what have the Romans ever done for us? And finally, one guy raises his, uh, his hand and says, well, they brought peace. John Cleese goes, bah, what is peace worth? And it's a great scene because it shows why Rome was such a successful empire for so long, uh, that they really did seek to make uh, the world Rome. And it was kind of a double-edged sword. If you opposed Rome, oh boy, things could get very bad for you very quick. Romans could be absolutely ruthless in war and very, very cruel in their punishments. But if you accepted Rome, Rome was amazingly pluralistic, and it was uh, amazingly, well, for the time, progressive, and allowed people to uh, live lives, and granted them the full protection of Roman citizenship. And this was so true that ultimately the emperors of Rome um, aren't Roman. Trajan, who was known as one of the greatest of the Roman emperors, himself was not Roman by birth. He was actually a Spaniard. Later on, you have Septimus Severus. Septimus Severus is actually Punic. He's actually from North Africa. And he they, they say that he didn't even know how to speak Latin properly. Um, but he became a Roman emperor. So Rome was amazing in the sense that it managed to create this very pluralistic, multi-ethnic, multi-religious society that somehow got along. Christians would kind of make, must mess that up a little bit. Uh, but we'll talk about that when we get there. So this shows how Roman character is fundamentally different than the Greek character, because you couldn't become Greek. The Athenians, all the people the Athenians conquered, you didn't just get to become an Athenian after they conquered you. No, you would never get the chance to be Athenian. But your children could become Romans and enjoy the blessings of the Roman state. And so people, you know, joined up. Rome wanted to make converts to its form of government and its form of life. One of the other things that you'll notice about Roman art is that it not only has this focus on civic life, on everyday life, it also has this focus on, on what we call uh, verism. Roman portraiture could not be more different from Greek portraiture or Greek images if we tried. That is, when you look at this Roman portrait, uh, this guy looks like he's had a hard life. He's got acne scars. All the warts and wrinkles are preserved. And this is a style of portraiture that we call verism. And verism comes from veritas, which means truth. And it means it has this extreme faithfulness to reality, or has this extreme candor, tries to show life as it really is. Compare this to the idealized portraits of gods or heroes or even rulers from uh, fifth century Greece, and you can see how dramatic the difference is. So why did Romans love and embrace this kind of gritty, uh, unattractive, uh, sometimes very uh, unattractive, uh, realism? And it has to do, again, with Roman religion. Now, we think of Roman religion, we think of Jupiter and Juno and all the big gods and etc. Well, that's civic religion. That's the religion of the state. And those were festivals that, you know, the state would perform. But the truth is, on a day-to-day -day basis, for most Romans, that wasn't the important part. The important part was the household religion, the religion of the home, of the domus. And you had a whole series of household gods. We call these lares and penates, and these are gods of hearth and home and household. Uh, these were gods of the pantry and the threshold. Uh, you, know, you would have dinner and you'd put a little off side of your plate as an offering to the gods. And then a large part of this is the concept that your own family becomes your own household gods, that your family has a kind of genius, and genius is a Latin word that means a kind of guardian angel-like spirit. Everybody has a genius, a kind of uh, essence to them, and that the family itself, the patrifamilias, has a kind of genius. And so you would keep images of your deceased ancestors in your home. And you would do this by making death masks. Here you can see one. This is an actual death mask that was made of someone. 
So here's a Lararium. This is one of these household shrines. Uh, they often had emblems on them. Snakes are emblems of fertility and rebirth. You see a man in a toga here making an offering. This is a, uh, a paten. Uh, this is an offering dish with a sacrificial knife and a bucrarion. This is uh, a bull skull. It's a sacrificial symbol. And these guys with horns on either side uh, with these cornucopia are lares. And these are household gods that represent the family. And many houses would have a columbarium. A columbarium is a place where you would put the ashes of your dead ancestors, or you would actually put images of your dead ancestors. And so if you need images, you would make these images by making death masks. Here's another one of these columbariums. So images of your ancestor were very important. If you're, if you're going to worship grandpa, you have to have an image of grandpa. And so since they started using death masks to make these images, or they would just push plaster or wax over the, the face of the deceased, the deceased is, you know, going to be old, usually when they die, and it's going to capture all the flaws and all the wrinkles. And you're going to see a preference develop for that kind of realism. Here you have another one of these Togata statues, and here he is holding the bust portraits of his ancestors. Um, and that's why this unknown Republican male wanted his portrait to look like him. So this develops a taste for extreme realism, this verism, and it passes out of the cult of ancestors and into everyday portraiture. Romans valued this because they thought it was honest and virtuous. That, you know, making your portrait look like you're some idealized, never aging, you know, athlete or hero or god, that might be fine for Greeks, but Romans are pragmatic types, and we're not going to put up with that nonsense. Nope. I'm old, I'm going to show myself as old. And you can actually see this in portraiture of prominent individuals, some of the most famous people in the Roman Republic. This is Cicero. Cicero was the great uh, orator and rhetorician. Uh, he's pretty much the guy who defines the standard of how Greek, excuse me, how Latin is supposed to be written and spoken. He was this great speaker in the Senate. But here he is, and they show him uh, balding, <laughs> uh, with a bulbous nose and even a little bit of a goiter uh, because he did. He had a goiter. So, you know, those are kind of the things that, I mean, heck, in our day, we'd Photoshop those out. I mean, but they didn't Photoshop those out. They wanted those there. Here's Pompey the Great. Pompey the Great was one of the greatest generals in Roman society, one of the most powerful figures in the Republic. And yet here he allows himself to be seen with a furrowed brow, uh, a kind of round uh, face, heavy jowls, bulbous nose. This is not something that you would think of as a great heroic figure. Think back to that portrait of Pericles uh, that we saw. Uh, not even Pericles allowed himself to get old. The Greeks allowed themselves, uh, you know, to, uh, they allowed their vanity to kind of take over. And they never allowed themselves to age. But Romans allowed themselves to age in their portraits. So that's one way that Roman art is going to be very, very different from Greek art. Another way that Roman art is going to be different from Greek art is it's going to be more concerned with the historical, more concerned with the mundane. And, you know, they liked showing scenes of, of themselves uh, realistically. They liked realistic portraits. So it makes sense that they would also like realistic scenes. And we can see that in this example. Now, this is from the altar of Domitius Ahenobarbus, and sometimes known as the Relief from the Temple of Neptune. Uh, so-called because it shows Neptune in triumph with Amphitre, his wife. And you can see that there's this Nereid uh, leading their chariot across the sea. But there's a whole series of reliefs on this thing. And one of the more remarkable reliefs is this relief. And this relief doesn't show gods. It doesn't show heroes. It doesn't show myths or anything like that. It, in fact, shows a census taking and taxation. That's about the most mundane thing you can imagine doing. It is a memorial relief uh, honoring bookkeeping. You can't, you can't even imagine this happening in the Greek world. And so it starts over here with the scene of 
the tax and the census taking itself. So we have two figures. One is marking down in a tablet, in a wax tablet, the records. Other people are debating. They're you know talking about the nature of the records, uh, paying off the taxes. As we move to the center scene, we see kind of soldiers presiding over a sacrifice. Every you know public function had to have a sacrifice. So a bull and uh, you know a ram and a pig are being led to the sacrifice. But what I love is this end over here. You know you have soldiers keeping the peace, so that you know you have a crowd. You don't want them to uh, get unruly. And the soldiers here are shown not as great nude heroes, the way they would have been shown in the Greek world, um, but they're instead shown as ordinary soldiers. One of them is, you know, kind of, you know, taking care of his horse. Uh, one of them is leaning on his shield because he's obviously bored. And you can imagine these two guys having a conversation like, hey, you know, did you catch the chariot races last night? Uh, it's a very candid, very everyday kind of depiction and we call this genre uh, we call this genre and you're going to see much a lot more scenes of everyday life or mundane everyday life in Roman art than you ever would in the Greek uh, if you think to the Panathenaic frieze um, while there's some parts of it that seem a little mundane it's mixed in with gods and heroes and historical figures from the past and uh, Roman art is much more direct and much more interested in their own kind of immediate history. At the Basilica Amelia, we have a relief and the relief shows scenes from Roman history, but none of these scenes invoke the gods in any kind of concrete way. Instead, uh, they, show, they show kind of relatively uh, mundane and historical events. This is the Rape of the Sabines. Rape of the Sabines, long story short, uh, Romans needed women, uh, so they went over to the next tribe, the Sabines, and they took the women away. And by the time the uh, the Sabine men caught up with them, uh, the Sabine women had been married and integrated into Roman society, and so they couldn't be separated, so the two tribes became one. Here's another one that's called uh, the Punishment of Tarpeia. Tarpeia was this uh, woman who betrayed Rome, and she made an offer to an invading uh, army saying, I will do it for uh, what's on your arm, on what's on the arm. And every soldier had a gold band on his arm, but they misunderstood what she meant. And so when she showed them the secret way into the city, instead of giving them the gold armband, they gave them her shields, the, sh the shields that were on their arm. And she's crushed alive under this weight of shields. So this is kind of uh, ironic, uh, you know, karma that happens to her. But again, there's nothing invoked here of gods. It's, it's all the history of Rome. And then we even have a, another level, which is what we call plebeian art. Take a look at this relief and compare it in style to this relief. Romans obviously were influenced by Greeks, and so they adopted this high level of classicism with accurate anatomy, accurate posing, and accurate drapery, a variety of dynamic poses, and this just doesn't look like that at all. Um, the drapery isn't very accurate. I mean, if you look at these figures, the drapery is all the same. They all have this kind of V-shaped drapery. It's almost like drawn on. Uh, there's nothing like the body being revealed. The figures don't stand in real space. They instead stand on little kind of ground lines that are floating. The scene is a funeral procession. And we have the sarcophagus of the deceased here uh, being carried along. We have mourners. This person's pulling their hair out. Uh, we have what is probably the wife of the family of the deceased mourning musicians going ahead. What I love is that they want to show that this sarcophagus is being carried um, by uh, 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 on a litter. It's being carried by um, litter bearers. But in order to get the litter in there, they've had to make some of them midgets and hobbits and some of them uh, men of Numenor. So there's this huge discrepancy in the height between the two of them, which is silly. Uh, and it seems really primitive. Uh, but of course, they liked this. Now, this what's interesting is that this is a very fascinating reality with Rome, is that there are multiple styles existing simultaneously. Um, that you have commoners and others uh, making styles of art that we would consider to be primitive, you have more official art 
that has much more high style, much more Greek style art. And these things exist contemporaneously throughout the entire Roman Empire, and they will mix and mingle in bizarre ways. That's not nearly so true in the Greek world. In the Greek world, there's a kind of progression, and there really is only one high style of art, uh, whereas in Rome, you will see a lot more crossover, a lot more social stratification, and a lot more differences in varieties of art. All right, so let's get into the history of Republican Rome and how it forms. Uh, in the 4th and into the 3rd century, we have the Punic Wars, uh, and the Punic Wars are where Rome really becomes an empire. And Romans, by necessity, fight a series of wars with foreign powers. Uh, and Livy and Tacitus both say, Roman historians both say, that Rome became an empire by accident, that it was being attacked by all these foreign powers, and it would have been content to be a small nation, except they kept getting attacked, so they had to defend themselves. Uh, the war uh, against Carthage, of course, is the big one. Carthage, of course, was this major power. Uh, these are Phoenicians who settled in North Africa. And the most important war is the, is the Second Punic War, where Hannibal Barca actually travels through the Alps and brings his war elephants and brings absolute devastation to uh, Rome. Uh, and Rome is, is desperate, so desperate that they decide to launch a counteroffensive, and they send a guy by the name of Scipio Africanus. Uh, Scipio, if you, if you live in Utah, there's a town named Scipio. Now you know who it's named for. And Scipio Africanus decides to take the battle to Carthage. And he actually travels to Carthage and sieges Carthage. And the Carthaginians plead for Hannibal to come back. Hannibal, of course, has to give up his siege of Italy and returns, and he's defeated by Scipio Africanus. And the Romans resolve that uh, they've fought several wars with Carthage at this point, and they decide that's it. Carthage is now going to be a territory. And they sow the fields of Carthage with salt to prevent the Carthaginians from growing their own food, and they make them dependent on Rome, and they make them part of the empire. And so little by little, Rome grows, first in the Italian peninsula, and then to eventually conquer all of the Mediterranean, including all of what was once Greece, Athens, Sparta, Macedonia, Egypt, the Levant, all of these areas that were once major centers of Greek culture and, uh, and art. And there's even a line in um, by Livy, Livy the Roman historian, says that Greece conquers their barbarian captors. And what he meant by that is that, yes, Rome won the wars, and Rome eventually conquered this entire territory, but Greece and Greek culture ultimately prevailed and won the day. Now, maybe that's true. That's, a, that's not quite true. Rome, that makes suggest that Romans didn't have any culture. This is this common idea that Rome didn't have any true culture. It just stole or copied the culture of the Greeks. But that's not really true. Rome really did have its own culture, but there's no doubt that they loved Greek culture and integrated it as well. So first by conquering Carthage, they then conquer Syracuse, they conquer mainland Greece. And then we get into a very difficult period called the Roman Civil Wars. The end result of is we wind up into the imperial period, the reign of Augustus and eventually the Julio-Claudians. And so we divide Roman art history um, by the break between the Republican period, where they're ruled by a Republican form of government, and the imperial period, where they're ruled by an emperor. And once we get to the imperial period, then we're going to break down all the subsequent periods by dynasties, that you're going to have a series of dynasties, one after the other, ruling. And so then, then you date things not by uh, whether it's Republican or Imperial, you date it by what, di what dynasty it happens to fall under. So let's talk a little bit more about Rome and the Roman Forum itself. So there is the Tiber Island, and it's this region here which becomes the heart of ancient Rome. And this is the region here 
And there's three major sites here that we need to talk about. The first is the Palatine. The Palatine is the site of the first settlement, but it later becomes the site of Roman government because it becomes the site of the imperial palace, the Domus Augustana. And this becomes the palace of all the emperors of Rome. And in fact, Palatine is where we get the word palace. The other major area is the Capitoline. And the Capitoline is where the temple to Jupiter Optimus Maximus existed. So it was the religious center of Rome. It was the cult center of Rome. And that's not incidentally where we also get the word capital. And sandwiched in between these is a kind of triangular section of land, which is the Roman Forum. The Roman Forum is where they would, it's where the Roman Senate is located. It's also where the major marketplaces were located. It's where Romans would have debates and public events, etc. So here we are seeing uh, the Roman Forum right here and the Capitoline right here. And we're seeing this from about where the Palatine would be. So as if we we're seeing it from the Palatine. This is a view of the Roman Forum today. This is being, this is up on the west end of the Forum and looking towards the east. Here's a reconstruction of what it would have looked like at the time. And not all of these structures are built at the same time. In the early Republican period, predominantly only the structures on this end existed, and then not even all of these monuments uh, existed. The uh, Roman Forum is a constantly changing environment, and as new emperors and rulers came in, they would build new monuments. But you can look down and see there's the Colosseum that would eventually be built um, by the Flavian dynasty. There's not much there today, unfortunately. A few major monuments survive. Uh, we have the foundations to temples. So here's the temple of Castor and Pollux. So we have the, temp the foundation to the Basilica Julia. We have the temple of Saturn up here. This is the arch of Septimus Severus. This is the Curia or Senate house right here. Down on this end, we have the foundation of the Temple of the Divine Julius Caesar. And we also have a little bit of the Temple of the Vestal Virgins. Uh, this is mostly a medieval and Renaissance building, but the lower section of it was actually a Roman building. Uh, this was the Tabularium, which is the record house. So probably the best recreation of the Roman Forum actually happens in the movie uh, the Fall of the Roman Empire. So The Fall of the Roman Empire was a movie made by Anthony Mann in 1964. And he actually had a 9 tenth scale reproduction of the entire Roman Forum built just outside of Madrid where he filmed the movie. And so it's one of these great epic movies. So we'll see if we can get this to work right here. Hopefully you can hear the sound as well. Okay, so first off, let me explain what you're seeing here. Uh, you're seeing uh, the uh, a triumph scene. A triumph is when a general won a victory in battle. Uh, he would be given a triumph and he would be treated as God for a day. And so this is the triumph of Commodus. This is from the second century of, of Rome, but it gives a really good view. So we pan down to see this beautiful reconstruction of the Forum of Rome. And again, this is long before CGI. Every single person you see in this is real. Everything you see is real. So here are the Roman legions marching through a triumphal arch. In the background there, which you can see right there, is the Temple of the Vestal Virgin. This is the temple of Castor and Pollux. In a bit, we'll get to see Sophia Loren. Here are the soldiers bearing the images of the emperor through the city. And this is something that would actually happen. Every time the Romans would win a great victory, they would come through the center of the forum and distribute the spoils to the people. There's Sophia Loren in a ridiculous outfit, but she looked good, good in everything. Here you can see them throwing coins to the people. In reality, they usually distributed things like 
food and clothing. And here comes Commodus. Many people don't know this, but the, uh, the movie with Russell Crowe, Gladiator, is actually a remake of this movie. And there is Commodus, played by Christopher Plummer. You probably know him as the dad out of Sound of Music. He's playing the part here that uh, Joaquin Phoenix played in Gladiator. And he's actually creepier than Joaquin Phoenix, if you can believe that. So here they are crossing over to the other side of the forum. Behind them, you can see over here, this is the Basilica Julia. We get this beautiful look down. We have the tabularium in back, uh, the Temple of Concord, the Temple of Vespasian. And then over here in the very far back is the Capitol. And so Commodus will come into the city and he will give his crown, his laurel crown, the emblem of his victory, to Jove, to Jupiter, uh, as a sign that his victory was ultimately from the gods. As we cross over, what we're going to see here is this is the rostrum. This was the speaking platform in Rome. This over here is the Temple of Saturn. This is the Temple of Vespasian. And they're going to go up the switchbacks up to the Capitolium. Many of the soldiers here were actual soldiers in Franco's army in Spain. Uh, here we're going to see a bit where uh, Christopher Plummer playing Commodus is going to uh, stop in his chariot and he's going to give a salute to the crowd. And <laughs> the salute is the ad locutio, where you speak to a crowd. Now Anthony Mann was trying to make a commentary about fascism, so he has him, has him make a fascist salute. Uh, and that's not really historically accurate, but, you know, he was trying to say that, you know, Rome descended into fascism. There you go. Uh, a Roman salute is actually very different than that. We'll see a Roman salute. So there is the rostrum that you're seeing right there. There's the Capitolium behind him right now. Now I'll get to say hail, Caesar. Now there's a fun moment up here where he's going to get off the chariot and just as he gets off the chariot, the guy in the chariot with him is going to say something. I want you to listen to it. Remember, thou art mortal. So he says, remember thou art mortal. And that is historically accurate. You know, if you were... A general winning a triumph you'd be treated as a god for a day but there was a slave that would stand in the chariot and whisper to you remember thou art mortal so again it's this Roman pragmatism coming to the fore he's gonna go up into the Capitolium he's going to take the laurel crown off his head and present it to Jupiter Optimus Maximum And then he's going to give this really wonderful cat that ate the canary smile that is just way creepier than anything Joaquin Phoenix ever pulled out. So it's a great moment. Christopher Plummer is an incredible actor. He's still acting. So if you saw Knives Out, he plays the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, patriarch that dies in Knives Out. So he looks up to the god and gives this wonderful smile. Fantastic movie and probably the most accurate uh, recreation of the Roman form that's ever been done. Uh, unfortunately, it bombed. It uh, bombed terribly. But anyhow, so moving on. Here you can get a kind of view of the Roman forum from the top. Uh, just to kind of highlight where we were. Uh, that procession walked through here, crossed over to this side, crossed over to this side, and crossed over here, and then went up here to the Capitolium. They put the Capitolium a little too close, but, you know, hey, we're nitpicking. Uh, so we're going to look at some of the fundamental pieces of architecture in the Forum, and, and fundamental pieces of Roman architecture, and one of the most important is going to be the Basilica. This is the Basilica Julia, which was built by Julius Caesar and Julius Caesar's family. 
It's not much left of it today. In fact, that's it. It's just the foundations. But the basilica is one of the defining features of Roman architecture. It is to Roman architecture what the stoa was to Greek architecture. In fact, it's very similar to a stoa. It's essentially uh, a building full of columns and porches. It has a forest of columns, but in the interior, there's an atrium, and the atrium allows to have this open interior. This is what it would have looked like from the exterior. And notice that we have, uh, in Roman architecture, a series of arches, and superimposed on those arches are engaged columns. So instead of freestanding columns, we have what are called piers. And that's going to be a, a feature of Roman architecture, too. So the basilica was a secular piece of architecture. It was used as a courthouse, as a public meeting place. It was also used as a marketplace uh, and place where people could come to discuss and, and uh, do many different things. The religious uh, center of Rome, of course, is going to be up on the Capitolium. So here you see people going down. Uh, this is the Basilica Julia right here. This is going to be the Temple of Saturn. Uh, this is the Temple of Concord right here. This is the tabularium right behind it. And these people are proceeding on a religious procession that will eventually wind its way up to this part here, which is located right here. And that is the Capitoline Temple. Now today, if you go to this spot, uh, the part that was once occupied by the Capitoline Temple is now occupied by the Campidolio. The Campidolio is the famous uh, Capitoline Museum and Square that was redone by Michelangelo. But up on this location, there sat uh, the largest temple in Rome. Well, the largest, at least in the early Republican period. And this is the Capitoline Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. Uh, not a transformer, that's somebody different, but it's located right there. So here's the Roman Forum down on this side. Now this originally was an Etruscan temple, and there was an Etruscan temple on this site, and it probably looked very much like an Etruscan temple. It's, in fact, many of the features of it look like an Etruscan temple. It's set up on a podium. It doesn't have stairs that go all the way around. It doesn't have a peristyle that goes all the way you can't approach it from any direction. It doesn't have a, an opposthitimus or a porch on the back side just to, you know, balance out the porch on the front side. Instead, what you have is a massive podium and a massive porch in front and then a cella beyond. Not much of this exists. There's a few foundation walls. But of course, this gets rebuilt in the Roman period. But the Romans are going to pick up on that Etruscan influence. So when we have a, a kind of this is our best idea at a hypothetical plan. You can see that it has the front staircase uh, and porch like an Etruscan temple, but it starts to have columns around the side. And again, instead of a single cella, it has a triple cella, one for each of the Capitoline triad. In the center would have been Jupiter or Jove. Uh, to the side would have been Juno, uh, the queen of the gods. And then on the other side would have been Minerva. Here's a reconstruction of what we think this would have looked like at Roman times, although it's kind of conjectural. The reason we can kind of reconstruct this is because a number of Roman temples have survived from the Republican and Imperial period. A little ways down from the Forum Romanum is another forum, the Forum uh, Boarium, and in there is a temple that was formerly called the Temple of Fortuna Virilis, but now, now they're calling it the Temple of Portunus. Uh, give it another 30 years, they'll call it something else. Uh, research changes constantly. <clears throat> when I was a student, this was the Temple of Fortuna Virilis, and now they call it the Temple of Fortunus. We'll come up with a different name. And then, we'll, you know, somebody will find some evidence that says, oh, nope, that's wrong. And then it'll be the temple formerly known as the temple formerly known as uh, Fortuna Virilis. But anyway. So right off, you should be able to recognize this thing has a lot of Greek-looking features. Take a look at the order. Um, this has been heavily restored recently, but you can tell this is the Ionic order. And it has a, a very strong Greek character. It actually has a, a set of stairs that go all the way around, like a stereobate, uh, but it also has a front podium. And then also, if you notice towards the back, uh, it has columns that go all the way around, but there's no porch. There's no porch or there's no way you could walk behind these columns. Uh, these haven't been 
infilled with rock. This is just the way it always was. And so we see that this is kind of a blend of Greek and Etruscan ideas. It has not a, uh, a peristyle or a colonnade that goes all around, but instead it has a pseudo-peripteral colonnade. And what we mean by pseudo-peripteral is it's not a true colonnade, but it looks like a colonnade and the columns are engaged. So this is a way for Greeks to make, excuse me, this is a way for Romans to make a temple that looks Greek-like, but still maintain the fundamental architectonics and structure of an Etruscan temple with only a front porch and a deep uh, set of stairs and a high podium. There's a few other temples that exist from this time period. It's really remarkable. Uh, one of the best preserved is the Maison Carrie. This one is actually in the south of France. But the south of France was once part of Rome. And when you can see this one, it's just a, a gorgeous temple. Uh, and you can see that it looks very Greek, but these columns back here are engaged. There's no portico that you could go into. What I find so funny about this is that they were so conscientious about emulating the Greek style that they make sure to put those three steps, the stylobate and the stereobate, all the way around the building. Uh, but you got to watch that last step. It's a doozy. <laughs> There's no way you could actually use these as steps. So it's purely formalistic at this part, but it's obvious that the Romans love the high style of the Greeks, but these buildings still have to function like Etruscan or Roman temples. So they'll have this tall podium. Now the column capital up here is something we haven't talked about before. And so we ought to talk about it now. This is the Corinthian order. Now the Corinthian order was presumably invented in Corinth, uh, which is in Greece. It's on the Isthmus. It's right between the Peloponnese and the Attic, uh, Attican Peninsula. Uh, and this was something that was invented in Greece, uh, but you only see it in the later periods in Greece. It doesn't show up uh, very early, but it's very, very common in the Roman world, which is why I've chosen to show it to you here. It's very, very similar to the Ionic. In fact, the major difference between it and the Ionic is the capital. Notice that it still has volutes, but the volutes are much smaller. And it has all of this vegetation. This is what we call acanthus. Acanthus is a common weed. It grows all over the Eastern Mediterranean, but it becomes used as a source of decoration. The story of the Corinthian capital is that an architect was cudgeling his brains for some new idea in ancient uh, Greece. And he went out to a graveyard and someone had left a pot on the grave. Remember, they used to leave pots on graves and fill them up with foodstuffs or oil or wine as offerings to the deceased. But they had placed a tile on top of the pot. And the tile and the pot had been there for some time. So weeds had grown up around the pot. And if you look at this, you can almost imagine it. The abacus up here looks like a tile. You can see what looks like might be a vase back there. And you can imagine this is a vase overgrown with weeds. Well, the architect said, ah, Eureka. Uh, and he went back and drew it up. And that became uh, the creation of the Corinthian style. Uh, the Corinthian style uh, is the third major order of the Greek orders. The Doric being the first, the Ionic being the second, and the Corinthian is going to be the third. There's a few other orders that we'll talk about as, as they become important, Tuscan, uh, Pergamene, etc. But these are going to be the three major orders. Uh, the Corinthian is kind of a composite order. That is, it has many of the features of the Ionic, but it also carries some of the features of the Doric. It's not going to have the tree glyphs or the metopes. Uh, it is going to be taller. It's going to have a base. But it's going to be seen as mixing concepts of male and female together. So if the Ionic is female and the Doric is male, the Corinthian is going to be uh, a kind of blend between the two. And conceptually, it's used that way. In fact, the first Corinthian column we see is we see in the temple of Apollo at Basai. Uh, and there's only one of them, and it's right in the center of the temple. So it obviously has some kind of cultic or mystic function. Uh, the top taking on the form of a kind of sacred tree. It's really interesting. 
But the Corinthian is by far the most popular order in all of Rome. And from this point onward, we're going to see a lot more um, uh, Corinthian columns than anything else. Now, just outside Rome is a very interesting site known as Perneste or Palestrina. And it's a hilltop town, gorgeous place. And if you look up there today, you can see the remnants of a Roman temple. The Roman temple has had uh, medieval and Renaissance additions added to it, but all of this here was built by the Romans. The reason we're gonna explore this is because it shows one of the things that really makes Roman art and architecture unique. And that is the advent of concrete and vaulting. This is what it would have looked like in its original incarnation. It's on quite a steep hill. In fact, it's on such a steep hill that there really wasn't any room to build it. So the Romans actually built an artificial platform to support this temple. This is, of course, a temple dedicated to Fortuna. This is the goddess of chance. So this is Fortuna uh, Primogenia, the, the mother of all. And it's amazing how much of this structure is still there. Uh, the large ramps and also all of these vaults supporting the upper part of it. If you look at Roman architecture, Roman architecture is often very axial. That means it is symmetrical one side to the other. Greek architecture is the individual buildings are symmetrical, but the arrangement of those buildings, if you think back to the Acropolis, is often, you know, it often fits the geography. Uh, Greeks didn't have the kind of engineering that Romans did, and so they had to make their buildings fit the landscape. But Romans do just the opposite. Romans make the landscape fit their buildings. They designed this building, they put it here, and they had to build this enormous platform. Well, how did they do that? They did it through concrete vaulting. We've talked about vaulting before, but vaulting is just what happens when you take an arch and you stretch it. And this created these large supporting structures that could then support the temple above. But the other thing that really makes this work is concrete. Romans uh, were pioneers of concrete. They didn't invent concrete. Concrete actually had been invented before, but they were the first to perfect it and to use it. Roman concrete is a very specific mixture made out of aggregate, which is broken rock or brick, uh, cement, and volcanic sand that's called pozzolana. And volcanic sand was this black sand that came out of the Bay of Naples. And it had a very interesting feature in that it made uh, the cement very hard, very long wearing, and even waterproof. Uh, Roman concrete, I hate to break it to you, is actually superior to our concrete. We use Portland cement in our concrete, and Portland cement uh, actually degrades over time. All the big concrete buildings on campus at UVU are destined for destruction. We use ferro-concrete. Ferro-concrete is concrete reinforced with uh, rebar, with steel rods. Uh, but the problem with steel rods is they eventually rust, and when they rust, they expand, and this cracks the concrete. And this ultimately dooms the concrete. It's cheap, it's easy, it's effective, you can build some great stuff with it, but most of our concrete structures have a maximum lifespan of about 100, 150 years. Uh, some of these Roman buildings in concrete, they have no reinforcing metal in them at all. Many of them don't even have expansion joints or other kind of modern features, and yet they've, stand, they've stood for 2,000 years. They'll probably stand for another 2,000 years, and they'll outlast our concrete structures by ages. Concrete is really versatile because it's a, a liquid medium. Uh, Roman concrete tended to be very stiff. It was usually carried in baskets. And you can, you know, basically mold it into any shape you want. So Romans would build walls that were often faced with bricks or stones. And then they would fill the interior space with concrete. Well, then you could then mold that concrete into any shape that you want, into a vault, into an arch, uh, into anything. And Roman concrete, by virtue of it being waterproof, and it could actually cure underwater. Now, go pour a bucket of concrete underwater today, and it'll just turn into sludge. Uh, but Roman concrete would actually harden underwater. It's amazing stuff. Some of these Roman concrete piers are still standing. So this gave Romans an incredible edge in engineering, and so Romans would build harbors where there was no harbor. 
the harbor at Caesarea uh, is still a Roman harbor. And so the thing that sets Romans apart is their engineering. They would engineer harbors, lighthouses, ports, bridges, and aqueducts. Aqueducts they were famous for. This is a bridge spanning a river again in southern France, uh, and the upper part is actually an aqueduct carrying water, fresh water from uh, a, a far distant location, and I think it's still functioning. Some aqueducts today are still functioning 2,000 years later. Uh, the Aqua Claudia had to be repaired a few times, but it's still functioning. Um, it's an aqueduct in Rome, uh, and these aqueducts would go right through the mountains. They would cut right through the living rock, uh, and they knew how to grade these aqueducts so that the water was constantly moving so that it would never stagnate or go bad. Uh, there are some aqueducts that are bringing uh, water from a distance of over 300 miles. It's really incredible. And here you can see this bridge that was built to be an aqueduct to bring fresh water, uh, and it's still standing today. But vaulting was in use everywhere in the Roman world was used to make bathhouses and homes, and eventually uh, they get very, very good at it. Uh, here's some of the earlier examples of the Stabian Baths at, at uh, Pompeii, but we get to build really gigantic structures, such as these vaults of the Basilica of Maxentius by the time we get to the early 4th century. All of this is brick-faced concrete. So this is really what makes Roman architecture so different this ability to create these vast uh, interior spaces and structures that are far, far larger than the Greeks ever could have built and that have much more interior space than the Greeks ever could have built. Okay, so that seems like a good place to break uh, for part one. We'll come back for part two uh, in the next uh, section. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.